Welcome everybody. Really pleased to see all of your faces and to have you join us for this workshop. My name is Hilary Inwood. I am the lead of environmental and sustainability education at OASI. And um, here as your webinar host today, uh, but very pleased that I, it's not my voice you're going to be listening to, but the voices of many of your colleagues in the TDSB. Um, I'd also like to introduce you to Pam Miller. Uh, Pam is the uh, instructional leader for Eco Schools. Pam, do you want to say welcome? It's great to see everybody, and I'm really learning how to do this webinar thing, just to note that Zoom can be used for adults uh, and with colleagues, but not with kids. Just to, uh, to let you know that you're in the eco-learning and e-learning workshop today. This is uh, put on collaboratively by OISE and by Toronto, Toronto District School Board's EcoSchools program. We're going to do just a very quick and brief introduction to Zoom. Then we're also going to do a land acknowledgement to begin and I'm gonna turn it right over to the EcoSchools teachers to talk a little bit about what they've been doing in their programs so far in terms of moving eco-learning to e-learning. We're uh, gonna end with some resources and tell you about, a little bit more about the upcoming uh, webinars that are in this series. Okay, well, well with that in mind, um, I will uh, start with the land acknowledgements. We would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which uh, Toronto operates. It's been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Patun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish Number One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. And I feel particularly uh, grateful today as spring is, seems to be a little slow in coming, but I feel very grateful for that. I'm hoping you're finding your moments uh, for gratitude as well as we go through this pandemic together. We're gonna get right uh, underway. I'd like to introduce you to Rebecca Chenin, who is one of our fabulous EcoSchools teachers in the TDSB. Uh, Rebecca, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here today. Um, when we, heard the schools were closing, my first thought was, oh no, how are my students and I going to finish the energy diet challenge? So I've been involved in this program for a few years and we only had about four challenges left to finish. So I'm gonna share with you some of the challenges and how we were managed, managed to complete the challenges through online learning. So for those of you that don't know, the energy diet challenge has been running for quite a few years and it's a program with some great eco-literacy lessons. This year there were 16 challenges and one of the challenges we had started just before March break was a research project on renewable energy. Uh, the second challenge is a recycling art project. The third one that we needed to finish was called Waterworks, and it teaches the kids about water conservation. And the final one is a video challenge. So before going to March break, my students had the chance to explore a giant map of Canada and they looked at the um, locations of where Canada produces its energy. This map of Canada can be borrowed from National Geographic. So this is an example of one of the students' projects on Can uh, Canada's renewable energy. In order for students to complete this from home, I took screenshots to give them directions of exactly where they needed to go. So to find the virtual library, they had to click on um, AW and go to our, our school, Port Royal and you, you see the virtual library beside the red arrow. Then they clicked read, watch, learn, and they went to Britannica School. From home, you have to enter a password. They entered elementary and they were able to do their research. So they researched information on wind, solar, and hydropower. Um, the great thing about Encyclopedia Brief Britannica is that it helps them cite their information as well. So you can see the little check mark with the square and it helps them create their bibliography. So this is one of the students' projects. They basically had to tell us what the source of power was, what are the advantages and disadvantages. The recycled art challenge involved students creating things and then making a display in the school. So because my students weren't able to display their art, I made a presentation and put it on Twitter for everyone to see. So here's an exa some examples of the art that they created at home.
So this is just Google Slides. And to put it on Twitter, I did a um, presentation where you publish to the web and it will just cycle through the slide. The third challenge is called Waterworks. And on the list of things to do that they get each day, I use a hyperdoc so that the kids have links directly to what they need to, to click on. So that one of the activities was to read a book called The Water Princess. And they had to, there was a handout with this challenge that they had to fill out. So they watched a video um, and they completed the handout online in our Google Classroom. So you can see this student had written, they can serve 93 liters of water. And the final challenge is the video challenge. And because my students had been using a program called Flipgrid already, I asked them to make short videos of how they can serve conserve energy. And I used little bits of their Flipgrid videos to put it together to make the one, video, one minute video for this challenge. And the final resource that I've been exploring recently is a, a website called ReadWorks. And it has amazing ecological literacy. And it's easy to upload into Google Classroom. Thanks, Rebecca. Those are fabulous ideas. Um, I'm really impressed with what you've been able to accomplish um, uh, with, with moving everything online. It seems pretty seamless. Have you had a lot of digital experience? So I'm a digital lead learner for TDSB, so I've been trained, and my students as well. Uh, next up for ideas, we've got Tisha Highbine. Okay, so my name is Tisha Highbine. I'm teaching kindergarten currently at Forest Hill Junior Public School. I took the option of not doing a Google Classroom or Brightspace. I found them quite complicated, and truthfully, that's not how I communicate with my parents on a daily basis. I have a lot of parents that are ELL. And with that, I found Google and Brightspace were quite a few more things parents needed to remember right now. And one of the big pieces for me was around health and well being. So trying to make this going online as easy as possible. And teaching kindergarten, parents were going to have to negotiate a lot of things. Um, typically in our day, we spend the first hour outside every day playing. So we do a lot of environmental ed outside and a lot of learning with loose parts and with nature. And when I talked to parents in the two weeks that they were missing school, um, both online, on the phone, all of them sent me pictures of their kids doing things outside. And it was really important for me to continue that when we went online because the parents had said this is what their kids were missing most. So I went to a lesson plan that involved the four frames. So the top part is belonging and contributing, self-regulation, well-being, problem solving and innovating. And the bottom part, for example, is demonstrating math and literacy skills. So my partner and I, my ECE partner, Ms. Vanna, we talked about what we would typically be doing. Because it was spring, we wanted to demonstrate spring and getting outside. So for example, here with self-regulation and well-being, there were bird songs that the kids could connect with and practice their breathing. Um, this was a picture of what's inside the nest and I connected a video, um, maybe I can even put it up, of something my son and I had found a couple of years ago. So this is just baby birds. And for many of my kids, they would never have had an opportunity to see that. Um, then we went on to, again, the problem solving and innovative piece. So getting kids back into thinking about that. So the activity that I wanted submitted to me was how could they use loose parts in their house to create a bird's nest? What might that look like? And then in literacy and numeracy, um, I performed a poem here and sent them a link that they then participated in and videotaped themselves doing. Um, this was a book that connected to birds. It's a really good book by Joanne Oppenheim. One of the reasons we decided to start with birds in particular is because birds are accessible to everybody. Even if you're in a building and you can't go outside, you can look out the window and see birds, you can go on your balcony and see birds, and they're a pretty universal experience for kids with ELL, etc. Um, 
and the diverse needs that I have in my class. Um, at that point in time, what I asked for last week was for the kids to do the mind map. So what questions do you have about birds? So that we could kind of start an inquiry that would explore things online. So when I looked at doing this presentation, what I wanted to show you was some of the things that parents shared back with me because I thought that this was very important. So using the nature connection, um, one family, what they had sent to me was pictures of their daughter exploring. The question was, you know, go out, lift up rocks, lift up logs, what can you find? Um, the parents submit them to me in their Google file, and then I comment on them and we have dialogue back and forth. This was another little girl who had went to the ravine. She actually sent me this picture in the mail. Um, through snail mail and she had learned how to use a little Polaroid camera and sent me the pictures of what she had found. Um, so just getting kids to go outside and explore in nature and share that back with me so that we can have that connection that we would normally have in the classroom. In this one I had asked kids to draw pictures of what they saw in the spring. This was pretty clever. It's two different kids. They actually decided to use food from their house so this little girl cut up fruits and vegetables, and these are the butterflies in the trees pollinating. This is the trunk of the tree with the mushrooms, uh, the grass with the cucumbers. This little guy, he did daffodils. So these are orange peels, pieces of celery, um, craisins, raisins, and cut up leaves, just to show me different ways with loose parts that they could design pictures of the spring. Back to the bird inquiry. So in the next slide, this was them showing me their mind map of what they were thinking about birds, what their questions were. For some of them, when I responded through Google Docs, I would further the question. So for example, one of them had, where do, oh, do birds have, does the birds have a good hiding spot? And I said, this is a question that I always think about. Where do birds go when it rains? Do they always go to their nest? Because sometimes their nests are exposed. So where do they go? How would we find that information out? Um, the next thing really had to do with going back to math and getting kids outside doing some of the math we would be doing at this time of year. So last week we had practiced skip counting. We had put it in our bodies. Um, this week, the task was to go out into nature find a big enough collection of something to show me that you can count by twos and add labels. So for this little guy, he wrote the numbers. And for this student, he actually used sticks to make the number 30 and he counted by twos. In the next slide, this little girl used clovers and little pieces of sticks. And one of the questions was when you count by twos, how many groups of two do you have? So she had put the label 20 and that it was 10 groups. And then this was a picture of today's assignment, which actually came from Juliet Robertson's Messy Maths. So it was making a number line and going out and finding things in nature to create that number line and share it with me. What I found through doing this is that the kids are that much more connected and they're really, really excited to learn. Their parents aren't complaining about the learning. Um, I did have your typical parents that wanted to immediately go online. But in my class, we don't do a lot of online things. It's really about hands-on experiential learning, getting outside in the outdoors. And one of the feedback um, pieces from parents coming back to me, which I thought was really useful, was they found that when they took their kids outdoors and did ravine exploration or climbing trees or walking around right now, it eliminated a lot of the frustrating behaviors in the house that I often see in the classroom too. Thank you so much, Tisha. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe what you have been able to accomplish. You also have been a, a fantastic segue to the next couple of uh, workshops we're gonna offer. We've got one coming up on nature journaling, which your children were doing with those bird drawings. I'd like to introduce you to Adrian Riggler next. Adrian is a teacher at Ryerson Community School. So I think um, I'm a good contrast to the first two presenters. A uh, couple of reasons. One, not quite the same level of digital skills as my two presenters, but also 
I have a grade six class and currently I have about 75% of them are online in my Google Classroom, but 50% of them are not allowed to go outside at all. So they don't even go outside. They haven't been outside since um, the March break began, um, not even to go and help with shopping or anything. They're being kept in the house. My, our first plan was for World Water Day, that was the week after March break. And um, I went out and did a water, like a stream trip and posted pictures and asked them to post links to their connections to water. But it was, um, at that point, I think I only had two students on and they just wrote, I'm not allowed to go outside. My mother said, I can't do this. So um, I'm gonna share the screen, just share a couple of ideas and things that I'm working on. So this is from my Google Classroom. Um, I posted a link. So I use the Google Classroom daily. I'm posting, um, like in the morning, there are their assignments and activities to do. And then um, for Earth Day, I was gonna put this up Monday. I put it up a little bit earlier to get some of them to post some things for you to see today, but really to try to make them to take a pledge on what action they can take to, from the comfort of their home to protect and uh, restore our planet. So in the, this is just one of the extensions in our Google Classroom is the Jamboard. So the students come in and they make a pledge and then I can respond to it. So for example, one of the students today said, I will sort my family garbage. And I said, great idea. What is your goal? Don't forget to include your name. Well, if they don't put their name in it, I don't know who's written that. So I try to encourage them to get their names in there. Um, you can, they can add more, but basically the students will go through and post up their pledges next week as to what their goals are for Earth Day. Hey, Adrian, somebody's asked, what's a sticky note in Google Classroom? So this is actually, a, this is Jamboard, J-A-M-B-O-A-R-D, and it's an extension in the, it's a Google extension you can add for free. It's part of our G Suite. Great, So Thank you. fairly easy to do. Um, if they don't have a, a touch screen, it's hard to use the pen, so I just use the sticky note. And uh, they can post their sticky note and edit, add photos and other things. So they can add images and things with it as well. So it's just a way of kind of, it's kind of like using your whiteboard where some people can come up or it's an interactive board basically that we use. Um, it's 50 years of Earth Day this year, so it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Other things I'm going to be doing next week, so I have invited a speaker for Earth Day. I'm trying to get a graduate student or a researcher from the Freshwater um, Restoration and Ecology Center at the University of Windsor to come in and do a live presentation on the action or the restoration project that they have running in the Detroit River and have a Q&A with that research student. So, and the other thing is it's poetry month. So in language, there's an amazing um, collection of nature and environmental poetry online. This is familyfriendlypoems.com, but there's so many out there. I was that teacher who walked away on, before the March break thinking that I, I would be back and all of my resources, all of my, my classroom teaching things, everything is left behind. So. I sit in, in my home trying to figure out, find resources. So this familyfriendlypoems.com was a great site for me. I'm having them rewrite poems. So Hey Little Bug, we've been talking about adjectives and um, metaphors, similes, different figures of speech. So we're having, they're rewriting poems. So creating their own verses for things like Hey Little Bug and kind of bringing in nature. We also share stories of hope. So I think it's really challenging for the kids in terms of mental health. So looking at this as an environmentalist and person who has been terrified about climate change and the climate crisis, I think that the stories of hope and are just really inspiring right now. And I think it's a really nice thing for children to think about that maybe, you know, what, what we're doing, it's really hard, but then it's like, do we want to go back to the way we were? So just kind of thinking about what, what are the things we've learned? about the impact of our choices now on the environment and what would we do differently moving forward. So um, I think that was it. Poetry Jamboard, inviting my guest speaker. Oh, the other one I have, um, because they are inside, I've been doing things like sprouting. So I've been sharing my sprouting story. So next week we're going to be doing a sprouting challenge and their first task is to look and see what seeds they can find in there at home 
and particularly in the cupboards. And so we're going to take a shot at having some students finding things like chickpeas, kidney beans, whatever beans they can find or seeds. And um, we're going to be sharing our sprouting stories. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I love the sprouting idea at the end. I got to try that myself, actually. I'm looking for ideas of how to garden with kids online, but that's one that most people would have some kind of seeds, but lentil chickpeas, as you were saying, in, at home, right? So yeah, we all, I, I mean, I, there might be some people who just have cans, but I, I work in a fairly diverse pot school and I, my feeling is that we're going to find some good things in the cupboards and, and, and document and most sprouts that you grow are great to eat. So I know I've been doing broccoli. I've had, um, these are mung beans that I've grown this week. So just my original plan was what, what can I have that's fresh if I can't get out to the store? So fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Bonnie Mulroney to speak next. Bonnie, welcome. Hi everyone. Um, just to give you an idea, um, I was going to talk to you a little bit about creating task boards for your classroom as well as um, links to your um, Google site. Uh, that was a digital way that you were uh, teaching. I'm going to share my screen right now just to kind of give you an idea. You teach grade three. Okay, so this is an example of my um, task board that I create. So basically I create a task board every week. Um, to post onto my Google Classroom for the students. So this one would be the one that is going to be ready for next week. So um, this one has to do with Earth Week because that is um, for next week. And it's about incorporating, um, um, I guess, differentiated instruction, but also a balanced literacy program because right now, um, for the elementary grades, the uh, focus is on um, language and math. So um, just to kind of give you an idea, this would be a task board that I post onto um, my Google Classroom. So um, there's connections with um, things that are happening right now. For example, Ramadan will be happening next week. So there's a Good Deeds um, tree. So basically I would put um, a link to that. So I embed the link um, onto um, the task board so the students can actually um, go and complete the work. Um, there's Earth Day activities um, with also, also links to like uh, YouTube videos. Um, also reading sites, another site that I do use is Epic. Okay, so that's another one too that you can look at. But as you can look over here, you can see that there are some connections um, with uh, literacy. So we're talking about um, creating opinions and write, uh, persuasive writing. So students would be creating a speech um, basically uh, there's an outline and a lesson attached to this task board, and they would um, eventually be recording their work onto Flipgrid. Now, basically everything um, in every box inside the task boards, um, there are links um, to lessons, readings that are all connected. So students would be able to actually complete their work online. Um, and then once it's posted into the Google Classroom, they can actually submit their work. So um, you provide a copy for every student so that when they do complete the, their work, they can actually just submit it to you and then you can assess it. The cool thing about this too is when you go onto your Google Classroom, um, if you do have one over here, um, th these would be, for example, um, this is my Google Classroom right here. And um, this is where basically I would be posting all their work. Um, so when you do post their work, um, and we go back to over here, April 14th. So uh, we talk about different task boards. So for um, next week, let's see over here, we'll go back over here to classwork. Um, and then we can see that um, there's a lot of resources and stuff that I have put into um, the Google Classroom. So students are able to um, click on links and it's easy for them to submit their work. So for example, if we look at um, this task board over here, when you are actually sharing it with your Google Classroom, you go into your classroom, just to kind of give you an idea, you would create an activity, you would create the assignment, and then you can attach from your Google Drive, okay? And then basically when you do attach something, just to give you an example. Okay, I guess it's not showing on the screen right now. But when you do assign it, um, you assign it so that every student um, is able to um, submit their work. Um, when you do have your students in the classroom, you can just click on one of your students and you can actually see the work that they've completed. Um, and then you can assess them based on that. So this is um, basically how it would work. 
Um, it's pretty fun. Um, the students are really loving it. Um, they are in grade three, but not only um, is a task board actually used um, on the Google, um, I guess on the Google Classroom, um, but there's also a Google site that you can use too. Um, some activities that I've worked with with um, my students is um, going outside for nature walks, um, talking about family experiences, um, talking about their own pets. So this is kind of like a sample of one of the activities that I've, I've done with um, my classroom. So teaching them how to create a slideshow. So even though they can't go outside, they can actually share um, pictures, maybe of pets that they have. They can create a slideshow and actually share it with the share button over here. They would just share it. So this is kind of like a sample of what I did just so the, um, the students could see the kind of pets that I've had growing up so they can talk about those things when connecting with nature um, as well as if you go um, if you talk about going outside I mean it's okay to take walks and nature walks right now so what are some things that they can do well when they go for nature walks they can actually kind of look and see what kind of living things are out there they can take pictures of those living things um, and they can share and post these um, one really good thing that I found that I, I've been able to use quite well um, is I've been able to have students share their work um, to me by creating a shared folder in their Google Drive. So um, these are just kind of like those really um, fun activities just to get the kids to go outside if they can and if not they can actually um, use things that they have at home, maybe uh, pictures of experiences that they have had in the past and they can talk about those things so it's about you know getting the kids to think about what what's happening with nature how to um, take the contents of what they see outside and bring it back into our virtual classroom and to share those ideas i love the idea of working with pets that's a fantastic idea and even if you don't have a pet currently you could talk about the pet you might want to have or pets you've had in the past exactly. there's lots of great connections to the more than human world there right which is fantastic mm -hmm really good for those uh, the students who aren't able to get outside right now. Thank you so much for sharing those wonderful ideas. I love that we're getting ideas about how to use Google Classroom along the way <laughs> of also learning how to do eco-learning online. So thank you to all of you so far. We've got two more presenters uh, who are prepared to share their ideas too. Can I introduce you to uh, her, her formal name's Marion, but those of us who know and love her call her Gigi, Gigi Shanks for our next presenter. So my situation is a little different in terms of being a teacher. I teach uh, grade seven, eight in a rotary position. I teach in a shop. So usually we're building. Um, I'm responsible for a couple of units in the science curriculum. The first one is for the grade sevens um, structures, which is quite easy. It structures in connect everything. And the other unit that I connect to for the grade eights is systems in action, which again has a lot of opportunities in terms of building and design. Um, I teach one section of science as well. Um, and it happened that just before we all got put on lockdown that um, we were studying the cell. And so one of the things I was interested in doing with that group of students in particular was looking at kind of the social justice of some aspects of, of biology, in particular disease. Um, and so we were going to focus um, on the immune system um, and on some of the social issues that have happened throughout history. So I had intended to read with them a book called Typhoid Mary, which is about a, a human carrier of typhoid in New York City in um, 1907. Our librarian had ordered the books for the students, but they didn't arrive before the lockdown. And so they don't have access to that. And since Corona is a disease, it seemed that it had some opportunities for them to connect to that. So we've been looking at some articles and I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Okay, so these are some of the things that we're considering. Um, in terms of, we've looked at water in the science. So one of the things that, um, that we're doing is we're tracking, uh, we're looking at an article about um, tracking sewage in um, as a means to predict where there could be a hot spot of COVID-19. Research seems to suggest that in the future there are going to be hot spots and those are areas that are going to have to be isolated. This is you know in the days to come when we're allowed to go back outside and resume some sense of normalcy. So this, um, this kind of ties into 
ways in which um, disease organisms have traveled through water and can continue to travel through water. Uh, in the case of COVID, there's no, no um, evidence to suggest that these are gonna be um, uh, um, virus particles that will be able to infect anybody. So it's more of a tracking aspect. Another thing to do, to do with COVID that has become apparent in several parts of the world is the change in the, in the normal um, fauna that are normally less visible in urban settings. So um, in Toronto and other areas, we know we have quite a lot of rat infestations. Uh, rats tend to move with, um, with food, but they tend to remain in a certain geographic area. So another thing that we're looking at is how animals have moved. And since they're locked down, there may be opportunities for them to be able to go out at least on walks and look at how garbage may be changing outside in, in their own local communities. Um, is there less restaurant refuse lying about in the streets? I know where we live, there's a restaurant that uh, leaves its bins um, in the uh, area that's an entrance to a park and the rats that are there are often quite bold during the day in the best of times. And since this COVID thing's been happening, there's not been that food source for those uh, rodents. So they have been uh, less uh, visible. As well, we've also heard stories about deers and foxes that are becoming more bold and coming into the city. Um, so uh, something for them to do would be to take a walk in their neighborhood um, if they've ordered food, notice the, um, and this is a, not exactly animal movement. Another thing though is to connecting to the environment is a kind of garbage that's being generated. Um, restaurants are, aren't allowing people to bring their own cups anymore for refills of coffee. Um, are restaurants that are doing takeout, what kind of containers are they using? Are they using ones that we can recycle in Toronto or are they using the black plastic ones that cannot be recycled? Um, there's a lot of uh, um, more net natural sounds out there right now, um, less traffic, and so there's opportunities to listen to birds. And like Adrian, the student population at the school where I teach um, is quite diverse. There's a group of students who are in an intensive French immersion program, and they live mostly in um, high-rise apartment buildings without much opportunity to get out. So, you know, sitting on a balcony or at least being able to open a window is something that they might be able to do. Um, another thing that's happening with uh, the COVID is food security, a uh, combination of people being um, put out of work because they have uh, contracted the disease and as a result, food plants are being closed down, um, as well as shortage of farmers who can go and do the work. So there's some articles um, that we've been looking at for that. And here the activity would be, uh, I think Adrian and I are on the same page, but try to save uh, seeds either from fruit or from plants um, and maybe try to grow them at home, either in soil or if you don't have soil, you take a shot at, uh, at a rookie uh, hydroponic approach. And another thing to do, if meat is a problem and um, you know, because, because of potential shortages, maybe think about cooking a vegan meal and looking up something um, on Google, which has an abundance of, uh, of Google, of, excuse me, of vegan recipes now. And the last thing, and this like, depends on whether or not the students are allowed out, uh, would be to get outside and just get some materials um, and build a structure uh, of their making. But the one I was thinking of was to try to design a, a structure that would be a, a, um, a house that they would make and then furnish it with uh, miniature types of furniture and they'd have to keep a scale and, um, and proportion in mind so that, uh, you know, they didn't make something that didn't fit into the space they had created. Uh, and so those were kind of the ideas that, that I was pursuing with the students. Um, again, trying to be cognizant because I'm not their homeroom teacher that I'm not, uh, I'm not really in a position to give them a lot of work, um, especially for the STEAM students, um, but trying to give them something that they can do that will be of interest, um, but also keep them learning in, a, in a, a timely way with developing a greater appreciation of some of the issues that we may not be thinking about, things like in, with respect to food security and who's gonna be most impacted by this.
Fantastic idea, Gigi. There, you've got so many interesting connections there to COVID-19 that I, I hadn't even thought about yet. Though I was investigating the connection you were talking about with water a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you've just given us some great ideas for working with older students. Thank you so much. We've um, got one more presenter, uh, the uh, amazing Nancy Gillis, who it looks like might be outside her school right now. Nancy, is that right? Are you picking up Wi-Fi outside your school? I walk to the nearest school because my internet's very slow. And I know when I'm doing Zoom meetings, I'm very choppy. So I thought it was a great way to problem solve until I got here and it started to snow. But uh, the sun is out again, I'm good. <laughs> so um, a lot of people have touched on some things that uh, I was going to say that's an advantage, I guess, to going last. Um, Rebecca and I were both working on the energy diet challenge before school closures. In fact, at 6 a.m. one morning, we texted back and forth on Twitter about, you know, what are we going to do and how are we going to finish this? Um, so that was a great friendship to have. Um, but certainly, I have to say that challenge was helpful because the kids were already fully engaged in it and they quite, kind of understood how it worked even though every challenge within it is unique. So that was actually my bridge um, in that sort of questionable couple of weeks where technically we would have been back to school, but we're not really supposed to be doing anything yet. Um, I was able to just say, listen, here are the challenges. Um, I did have a Google Classroom set up already, although they weren't used to getting on it from home. So that was quite a learning curve for some of them. But I was able to say, listen, here are the challenges you know, pick and choose. If you want to do one, great. If you can do it digitally somehow and share it with me, awesome. If you can't, do it on paper. Do it. It's open-ended. Do it how you want to do it. Maybe you, maybe you'll share it with me. Maybe you won't. So I tried to keep things very open-ended while I was gauging where everyone was at. Um, I do have a few kids who I can tell are not permitted to go outside right now. It does seem like a lot of my students are at least going for walks or bike rides, but that was something that I had to figure out over time as well. Um, the activity that I have to share right now um, relates also to growing seeds. Uh, one of the challenges we had left for the energy diet challenge was the get growing challenge. And I thought, oh boy, uh, we've got no place to come together and grow things. So I'll just pull up my screen. So, the first thing that I did was uh, I did my own planting at home. So I made a Google slideshow of my own planting uh, and I tried to keep it, actually I'll, I'll take, I'll go back a step. Before I did any of that, I actually emailed parents well in advance and I said, listen, in two weeks, I'm going to do this activity. I don't want anyone to make any special trips anywhere. I don't want you going to a store that you don't need to go to. But if you happen to be at a place where there are seeds or where there's soil, I'd love the kids to join in. I've made the joining in part um, an optional task. And I've been uh, giving them two tasks a day that are you know, required such as it is. Um, but I've always, I've always, I always add a third task that's a little more hands-on, a little bit more creative. Um, but I appreciate there can be some barriers to that. So I've kind of kept it open in that sense. But I did give them some warning that we would be doing this. Um, I planted vegetable seeds and some native plant seeds. And then within that, uh, I had some store-bought options. And then I also uh, used some seeds just from my food. So in this picture here, you can see these, green, these uh, pepper seeds were just literally from my pepper that I just finished a week ago. Um, and then the, there's a funny story. These pumpkin seeds are actually from our classroom, from pumpkins that we explored back in October that were just still sitting on the counter. And when I had that 15 minutes to go in and get whatever I needed, uh, you know, that's what I brought home. Other people brought <laughs> a lot of other things. I brought pumpkin seeds and soil. Um, but the pumpkin seeds actually this morning when I woke up, I was thrilled. They are sprouting and they're doing really well. So, and they just literally sat there. Um, so I've also shown the kids, you know, what else could you plant from your own food? Uh, that's my garlic. That's a seed out of my apple. I let them see that I had both some native plant seeds that I bought. And then this milkweed was actually from a nature hike that we went on in the fall that we had in the classroom and we were looking at it and I brought it home as well. So I tried to show them that there were some options within that. So I just took them through the process of what I had done at home. And then as I went along, I also had some questions that I asked along the way. Um, sometimes I put some links in the slideshow where they can find out more. Sometimes I've just invited them to try to find that out for themselves. But I basically let them see that whole process. Um, I planted some in peat pellets and then I gave them an opportunity to explore sort of where peat comes from 
and some of the environmental impact there. And then this was one of my ways to help uh, make this a little bit more accessible was looking at some alternatives uh, for starting seeds. So starting seeds in tea bags, the tea bag garden, and also starting seeds in coffee grounds. I don't know about you, but I have plenty of coffee grounds around, especially now. So that was another way that I sort of invited the kids to just see what they had. What seeds do you have in your cupboards, in your fridge? And then what else might you use other than soil to see if you can start the seeds? So for my tomato seeds, I had a lot of those. I planted them in four different uh, materials. So I've got some in tea bags here. I've got some in coffee grinds. I've got some in potting soil Look uh, down here. And then I've got some in the peat pellets that you buy at the store. And then as they go along, I also looked at, you know, covering the seeds and having them try to figure out why that was. And then I left them to think about um, some of the information in the slides. And then I wanted a way, um, I don't have everybody fully engaged in the online learning yet. I have a number of students who are waiting for devices still from TSC. I have some that just can't get themselves onto Google Classroom from home. So as I'm trying to sift through that, I did want to try to make this as, as accessible and fun to everyone as I could. So I decided we could do some um, predicting using a Google form. That way I was able to also email my slideshow and this form link to the parents. So some of, some of the kids can access a little bit on a parent's phone, but they can't do full activities in classroom. So I had a number of questions. Um, for them to make predictions on in terms of when they thought the different seeds would start to sprout, how long they thought that it would take, if they thought, you know, that it was going to grow in all the, the tomatoes would grow in the different substances and so on. So kind of a fun way, I even used six different types of tea um, and asked them if they thought that any type of tea might, might be preferred by the tomato seeds. Um, and then uh, with the question about the fact that I've planted so many tomato seeds, so I have 36 different tomato seeds on the on the go. And so a problem solving question about, you know, what am I going to do eventually if all those tomatoes, tomato seeds should grow into plants? Um, so this is what I'll be sharing with the next week is some of the some of the data that's developing now. This we just I just posted this yesterday, so the responses were still trickling in, but this is based on the first nine kids that uh, found it and engaged in it. So just predicting what they think will sprout first. Um, so now they'll be able to see those graphs and I'll be able to share with them the big reveal next week. So they know next week, we'll take a look at how things are going. And then this was shared with parents um, as some ideas for how they could further engage with it at home. So some of them probably have, you know, things that they're doing already in their garden. Certainly some of them are writing to me about that. Um, but I wanted to make it accessible. Maybe it's on a balcony, maybe it's on a windowsill. And again, maybe it's just things that you have in the kitchen already. And then for those that maybe aren't going to be permitted to grow, or that's just a challenge right now, um, just looking for signs of things starting to grow, more of a journaling type activity, um, house plants. I actually saw this online. Um, you know, what house plants do you have? Can you figure out what they are? What can you learn about them? Uh, and then, you know, this would be a review for my grade threes, but looking back to the stages of a flowering plant, maybe they're going to draw that out. Um, maybe um, we worked with the text, um, the flower in drama this year. And so I've tried to connect back to that, you know, think about your own flowering plant, maybe that you wish that you had invent one, describe it. So just trying to find some different ways. Nancy, those are such fantastic ideas. I think we have to have you back for our growing workshop uh, next month. <laughs> we a workshop on how to grow with kids online and you've got some wonderful ideas for that. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to also point out that we've got David Hawker Budlowski in the, in the workshop or the webinar today and he's going to be presenting on outdoor ed and climate, uh, climate change coming up in May. So you'll get that information soon enough too. Um, we're so thrilled for all of these great ideas. I think we need to have another one of these, yeah? Um, in May maybe, to share another set of ideas. It's obvious that um, uh, some of you are off to a flying start doing this work uh, online with your students. And I don't know about uh, the rest of you in this uh, workshop, we end up with over 65 in the end. Um, I, think, I think I need more ideas anyway, uh, as I move my classes online uh, come, uh, come May and June as well. So I'm just gonna do a very quick share to wrap up here. I just wanna um, tell you that we've got um, resources. I'm just gonna pop this up. 
uh, resources to share with you. Um, the North American Society, uh, Association for Environmental Education has a fantastic set of online resources that I can recommend. LSF is Learning for Sustainable Futures, a Toronto-based um, NGO that has great ideas. Uh, Green Learning has got a, a whole Earth Month calendar for you to follow along with online if you'd like. And Earth Day, um, both Canada and US, this is the US uh, link, um, has a fantastic set of um, environmental education at home resources that you can follow up with too. I just also noticed that Sunday Harrison from Green Thumbs Growing Kids is also doing a whole uh, series of online workshops around gardening uh, this month as well. So lots of great things happening and going on. We've got a couple more webinars coming up in April. We're going to have another whole set in May. And if we're still out, we're going to be continuing through June as well. So we encourage you to come back. Uh, Jen Vetter will be sharing the uh, detailed information. She's already sent out these the detailed information on these two workshops already through the Eco Schools newsletter. If you haven't signed up for it yet, then I would highly recommend you do so. Um, and uh, we will send out the next lot uh, in May once we are ready to go for that. If you're trying to contact either um, me at OISE or uh, the TDSB Eco Schools program, I've just put the contact information up on the screen as well. Um, can you join me with some, uh, some applause uh, for our uh, wonderful presenters today? Thank you so much to all of you who presented, and thank you so much to all who joined today. Thank you so much, everybody.